some of you wish you had more of it, but I'm still liking the cold, so I just want all of you to know that. 2 Corinthians 4 is a text that I have used a great deal in my preaching, uh, partly because I think especially some of the sections, particularly three of the verses that we're going to look at tonight, are verses that are critical to the perspective that we ought to have. And I've, I've talked to you about that in other lessons, and I'm going to allude to that tonight as we think about something that I think is very important. There is a, a contrast seen in these verses that I think is at the very heart of the dilemma that all of us face. And that dilemma is, is whether or not we're going to concentrate on those things that are eternal or we're going to concentrate on those things that are temporary. This crowd knows the right answer to that. But knowing the right answer and living by the right answer can be two totally different things. Sometimes we state it in this kind of way, living according to that which is spiritual as opposed to that which is carnal. That is the primary dilemma that all of us face. I'm not suggesting that there aren't other questions that we need to ask or answer and try to apply to our lives, but fundamentally... The essence of who we are and what we're about is, are we going to live life from a temporary, carnal standpoint, or are we going to live life from an eternal, spiritual standpoint? That, that is the essence of what I want to look at with you tonight for just a few minutes. The, the dilemma for some, I'm just going to mention maybe three years. The dilemma for some is, sh should I even care about a God that I cannot see? I think that's legitimate. I think it's legitimate for, for maybe people who don't know to say, why should I even care about a God that I can't even see? I have enough trouble caring for and being cared about when, uh, among people that I see. So why should I really care about a God that I cannot see? So I think that's legitimate. Or why should I be committed to a group of people who say that they are part of God's family when I don't even know those people? You know, maybe, maybe people who come into our assembly or people that we may talk to, and, and, and the question may be, why should I care about people who are, are, are care about godly things? And I think, again, that may be a legitimate concern. Or sometimes it's stated this way, why, why should I care about the Bible when the Bible is so irrelevant to a modern-day world? It's so really antiquated. It's old. It was written you know, several thousand years ago, it, it's the, the pages of the New Testament, especially the Old Testament, are irrelevant to my life. And I think that's a legitimate question to at least ask. Now, I think the fair thing to do is have someone be able to answer those questions and then fairly evaluate the answers to those questions. But I do think that they are legitimate questions to ask. And, and so some people just don't care about those kind of things because of maybe some of those things I've just mentioned and even other things that you can mention. These, these are the questions I think that unbelievers have. And because they ask the question, they simply don't care. But that's not our primary concern tonight. Tonight I want to ask you this question. Why is it that some who have a different perspective and I would even call it maybe a believer's perspective. They may not all be believers, but they have that perspective. They've been influenced by some who are believers. And so while they may not themselves be disciples, Christians, believers, they may find themselves asking some questions that have to do with, why should I care? Questions like, well, my parents have made me come all my life. You ever heard that from anybody? That's pretty. That's been a pretty frequent statement that I've heard younger people make. Well, my parents made me come on, and I can tell you this right now. I can tell you this right when I get to be 18, I'm, I'm done with it. But when I get to be 20, when I leave, I'm done with it. So there, there's a question that, that some people ask. And so when you ask them, why aren't you concerned about those kind of things? They just say, well, because I've been forced. That's something I've been forced to do. Another question that some people ask. They may say, I'm at a point in my life when I'm involved in other things. And I really don't have a lot of time for God. And again, on the surface, I will tell you that I think that's a pretty legitimate statement. I don't think there's legitimacy, legitimacy to the fact that that's a good excuse, but I know a lot of people make that. You know, I'm just too busy. I, 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 I want to honor God, and I know that's important, but right now I'm at a stage in my life where I'm just too busy to do it. So it's not a, I don't want to do it. It's just I don't want to do it right now. And some people 
don't have an attitude. And then I think there are even some that say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm moving toward kind of the, the, the latter stage of my life, and I'm really tired. I mean, I've experienced all that, that spiritual things and, and those kind of things really can, can give me in this life, and I'm really tired. It's time for me to kind of settle back, kind of slow down, and kind of just kind of ease on out. And so what, that, what that's really saying is I don't care, maybe, as much as I ought to care. And somehow we convince ourselves, I think, that there are really reasons why that is the case. Now, you may say, well, Kenny, none of that applies to me. And that's good. If none of that applies to you, I think that's a great thing. You, you, you may be one of the person who says, not, not only do I care, I care like I ought to care. And, and, and my life, I hope anyway, that my life is indicative of the fact that I care. But may I say this to all of us? If, if we took the time tonight to go around this room, we're not going to. Don't anybody panic. Get up and leave. But, but, but if I went tonight around and I just started over here with Bob, went to Renee, and I just started going all the way back, just going to everybody, and I said, no, we're, it's going to take a while. But if I said, and Bob won't mind me using him as an example, but if, if I started with Bob here and I said, now, raise your hand if you think Bob really cares about spiritual things. He's shaking a bit up here already, aren't you? I, if it was me, I'd be getting kind of nervous. I, I can't read anybody's heart. I can't read anybody's mind. But I can tell you this. I'll guarantee this. Not everybody in here is committed. Not everybody in here cares the same. There are some of those questions that I've already asked that some of us probably would say, that's me. And what that says is that we don't care, maybe like we ought to care. A couple of questions to consider. Why don't you care? And a, a question I think that comes right on the heels of that is, why should I care? And maybe, and what I want to ask tonight, the more pertinent question is, what's, in, what's getting in my way of caring? Uh, so so I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming tonight for the sake of argument and for the sake of the lesson to say, all right, some of us don't care. And what I want to do is maybe address what I think are three things that, that get in our way of caring about God and caring about those spiritual things like we, like we would. Let me, let me mention three. These, these are things that, that I'm going to choose to say block, block our ability to care about eternal things. And I think these are things that can affect us all. So I want you to do this. I want you to stay focused with me. And I, and I want you to, to not just say, well, you know, this, this is another one of those three-point lessons. I, when I mention these things, I want you to say, is that me? Is this what's keeping me from being, from caring like I need to care about God? So the first thing that I'm going to suggest is narcissism. If you can spell it, you can go on home. That's a pretty tough word to spell. It's the idea of just being selfish. It, it, it describes the person who can't think past themselves. I want you to turn over to Luke, the 12th chapter. I want you to look at a passage found in Luke 12. This is, this is an obvious place and a not-so-obvious place. Okay, it's, it's one of those stories, and it's a section of Scripture that's, that, that I think it's going to be very obvious and not so very obvious, if that makes any sense, which it probably doesn't. I'm not sure it makes sense to me after I've said it. Anyway, I knew what I was talking about when I was thinking about that. Luke 12, Jesus is trying to teach. And go back up to Luke 11. The last two verses of Luke 11 say this, And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse them. So he's trying to teach. A crowd is starting together. As a matter of fact, verse 1 says this, In the meantime, this is of chapter 12, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, just, let's just get the context of, of, the, of the statement here. 
Jesus is dealing with scribes and the Pharisees, and they're lying in wait, the text tells us, to catch him. And other people are gathering. Now, he, Jesus is going to use this, as he commonly did, to talk specifically to his disciples, but there are others who are gathering. They want to hear him. And this is a time, really, of popularity for Jesus as well. And, and, and people want to hear what he has to say. They're not, they're not turning away quite as quickly yet, but there are some, particularly scribes and Pharisees, who are stealing treacherously with him. That's what they're about. tough thing to say to a Pharisee. You need to be aware of the leaven of Pharisees. Now they're there, and they're dealing with some of this, and so Jesus gets right to it. He doesn't, he doesn't mince words, he just tells it like it is. And he's teaching about hypocrisy. And he's teaching about fearing God, and he's confessing Christ before men. And then, while all of that's good, and while all of that's an, an, an impressive statement that we can look at, and may pause at this later lesson, what I really want you to see is what happens in verse 13. Verse 13 of chapter 12, he says, Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, may I ask you a question? Is there anything prior, that you see prior, and let me ask this question, that would indicate that Jesus says, Okay, now it's question and answer time. Does anybody have a question? I don't see that. I see Jesus teaching, and then he says, Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. this is interrupted because at least in my mind it's not about what Jesus has been saying and this then interrupts and makes this statement and Jesus response in verse 14 is man who made me a judge or arbitrator over you it's pretty clear that Jesus is not interested in answering this man's question matter of fact he, he, he makes a statement a declaration about the man's statement that he wanted his inheritance and he wanted Jesus to tell him to tell his brother to keep that inheritance and Jesus said, who made you? Now, if anybody's a judge, if anybody should be an arbitrator, it'd be Jesus. But that's not what happens. Jesus uses this question, I think, to teach. But he's not going to answer this selfish man's declaration. It's not even a question. It's not a warning. It's not even a warning. Teacher, let me ask you a question. It's not a question. It's a statement. It's a statement of declaration. I need you to do this. And Jesus uses the interruption to teach. It seems to me it, it, it's kind of like when you're, you know, and, and all of us have experienced this, probably all of us have experienced this as, as both people. You know, when, a parent, when you're in a room talking to other adults and your kids come running in, and, and, what, and what, you know, what's the most urgent thing about them coming? Just the fact that they have a need. And a lot of times, in order to teach them, you know, they're going to come running in, and they're going to begin to ask you from the opposite side of the room until they get there. And by the time they get there, they're done. But they've been shouting the whole way. I got to pray. And, and what happens when they get there? You do this, don't we? And what we're telling them: you wait, wait. And we're trying to teach them. That the world does not revolve around them. They may think it does, but we're trying to teach them, no, you don't interrupt. You, you don't come and interrupt something that I'm in the middle of. You just wait. And, and as, you, as your kids learn, that gets better, doesn't it? I've even known of adults that barge into a room. They don't have to barge. They just barge into a conversation because what they've got is, and I'm not suggesting, I'm not talking about things that are emergency. I'm talking about things, though, where we just come in because many times we think that what I have to say and what I have to tell people is the most important thing going. And I, 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 I tend to understand that a little bit more. I, I know why sometimes that people do that. But it's hard, especially for young people, to wait. So, let me suggest this. Let me make an application. And, and, and maybe that's a poor illustration of the application I'm going to make. But I think what that man in Luke 12 is trying to deal with is, is that I've got something that's very important. And Jesus, I know, I know you're doing something, but I've got something. Because it seems like that that doesn't. Now, Jesus used this as an opportunity to kind of jump off and teach some other things. But I'm not sure that that's 
that, that that man didn't just jump up and say, listen, I've got a question that you need to help me with. And Jesus used this as an opportunity. But let me suggest this about all that. If you carnally, if, if who you are carnally, and I'm talking about things that aren't spiritual. I'm not necessarily talking about bad things, but things that don't relate to your spiritual well-being. If those carnal things are getting in the way of you spiritually, then you need to discuss your carnality with yourself. And, and the point of that is, is that we, we need to get what we want out of the way of what God wants. I had a member here this morning say to me and made a request, and I'm going to honor the request later, not later tonight, but later in the lesson. And the request was this, what does it mean to put God first? We talk about that all the time. I mean, it's almost every show. We deal with that. That's a great question. Let me ask you, what do you think that means? Just, just stop. My, my initial reaction is putting him first is saying I don't put myself first. And I don't put my carnal nature first. I put those things that are most important, that are of a spiritual, eternal, not carnal, temporal nature. I put those spiritual, eternal things ahead of myself. There's a lot of applications we can make with that. And when I, and I, when I present the lesson, we're going to make some of those applications. But that's a great point. That, that question is a great question. That's about as practical as it gets. What does it mean? Because it shows whether or not I really do care. And I think my, my initial answer is go back to 2 Corinthians 4.18. It says, for we don't, we don't look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That, that's what we're about. The hard part's not reading that. The hard part's not, not practice. Or the hard part is practicing that. What does that applicable a, uh, application really mean? That's where we get in trouble. So the first thing that I would suggest then about why we don't care, maybe things are getting away, is we're just selfish. I'm talking about all of us. But I, I will tell you that, that I'll go ahead and make the statement. None of us, none of us practice that the way God wants us to practice it. I wouldn't think. I, I, now, you better say, well, Kenny, you, you stepping on, you stepping there, you don't know. And that's true. I don't know. But I would tend to think that none of us give God that directive which he's asked us to do because we are, in essence, carnal people. We're earthy or earthly or temporary people. That, that's part of who we are. The, the, whole, the whole issue of becoming like God is moving from this part to this part. So we're all in transit, if you will. We're, we're trying to move in that direction. That's why, that's why lessons about what does it mean to, to put God first. That's why those lessons are so important. It just makes us think about, am I really doing that in my life? Or am I letting these other things get in the way? So, And I'll talk about that in just a moment in the, in the last point. So the first thing I would just suggest to you that this is narcissism or this selfishness. And I see that in me. I, I see that in me. I, I, I think on a daily basis, I see things in me that I say, this is what I want to do. <laughs> but, but that's not what I ought to do. That makes sense? My, my guess is that happens to you all the time too. I, I, know this is, I know this is not what I ought to do, but it's what I want to do. Well, that, that's a selfishness problem. And that gets in the way of us not caring about these spiritual things as well as we ought to do. So something else that can get in our way, and, and this, this may, I think this happens, and we're going to look at a passage. Turn over to Acts 17. You remember that passage? You ought to, be, you ought to have good practice on that because we looked at that this morning. We're going to look at a few verses back in that same section of Scripture now. Acts 17. And the point that I want to make is that ignorance can get in the way of us caring. You know, it's an absence of understanding what you're missing. That, that, that's the idea. You, you, you just, you're just not sure. In Acts 17, look at, uh, I'm just going to read a few verses in verse 24. This is when Paul was in Athens. And, and I want you to think about this. These, these people, I think these people were ignorant. Now, I don't know that they'd ever heard Paul preach. I don't think they had. It doesn't, it doesn't give the appearance that they had. But when he gets there, he says, you, 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 made, a, you made this God, this, this altar, this idol to an unknown God. So they didn't know. And he's trying to help them understand. So in essence, they really are ignorant people. 
beginning in verse 24, here's what I think he says. I know this is what he says, but I think he's saying this to those who were ignorant. And I don't mean, I don't mean by ignorant that they were dumb. Don't, sometimes we use that term very casually. We talk, well, you're ignorant. We talk about you're just stupid or you're just dumb. Words that my mother never would let me say. She'd probably call me tonight and tell me you shouldn't have said that in your sermon. Anyway, the, the point of that is sometimes we use those terms, and that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about an absence of knowledge. And so when he gets to these people who have this absence of knowledge, he says at the beginning of verse 24, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Now, I won't take the time to read it tonight because I read it this morning. And, he, and, and Luke goes on and records several things in the sermon that he says and then you get to verse 32, and here's what's, here's what's said there. When they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But here's what others said. Others said, we will hear you again on this matter. See, that's good. Now, the next verse tells us that some fully accepted what he had to say. They believed. I don't know, I don't know to what degree they believed, but, but they, they looked on favorably what he already had to say. But the, the statement before says, others said, we, we want to hear you again on this matter. Why do you think they wanted that? Because they didn't know, and they're learning, and they want to know more. Ha haven't, haven't, hasn't that happened to us before? It's happened to me. It happened to me a lot. I hear somebody talking about something that I may be unfamiliar with, or I've forgotten, or I just never knew, and they're talking about that, and, and I go, you know, I really hadn't thought about that. So I want to I want to hear more about that. That's, that's a plus. That's a good thing. And some on this occasion said to Paul, we want to hear you again. I don't know whether he had an opportunity for them to hear him again, but that's what they wanted to do because I think they were ignorant. So Paul preached to them and he taught them. Verse 28 says, I want to tell you about this God who, and in him we live and move and have our very being. Now I wouldn't have to say that to this crowd. I wouldn't have to say that to most people in this city who are religious, but that was something that was pretty direct to those people who were sitting there worshiping and honoring an idol made of wood. He said, I'm telling you about a God in, in whom we live and move and have our very being. And they were listening to that. And some of them said, we, we want to hear you again on the matter. This is verse 32 says, some did, some did mock him, but some wanted to hear him again. And let me tell you something about somebody that, that doesn't care about spiritual things because they're ignorant. That's, that's doable. That's solvable. That, that's something that we can, we can take care of. So if a person doesn't care because they just don't know, we can help that. Let, let me suggest this tonight. If you're in this audience tonight and you say, you know, Kenny, I've come, I've listened, but I don't get it. Or, or I've come and I've listened and I just don't see how you, these, some of these conclusions that you reach, I just don't see how you're reaching some of those conclusions. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with saying that. There's nothing wrong with thinking that. The next step in that is, let's talk about that. Let, let's look at that and let's ask ourselves, is, are these conclusions that I'm trying to reach or you or others are trying to reach, are they, are they conclusions that are biblical? But, but ignorance of what the Bible says and just absence of information can be solved by gathering the information and looking at it. That's, that's what Paul did. He began to talk to them about this. So here, here's my point. If you're here tonight and that's you, you say, you know, I just can't, I just don't know enough. Well, we can help. And, and what I mean by that is not that we can help indoctrinate you into what we think or what I think. I'm not here to indoctrinate anybody. I, I, I get weary of people talking about what, what we believe. And I, I know we use that to come date it. But we don't believe anything. I believe something and you believe something. And what we as individuals must do is be willing to teach people, here's what I believe the Bible teaches. And if you and I are willing as two honest people to sit down and say, what does the Bible say about that? I, I'm, I'm ignorant about that. And there's some things the Bible says that I'm ignorant about too. But let's be, let's be willing to honestly sit down and look and, and look at it together and be taught together. That, that's what this is about. In, in, in my experience, if I am have the fortunate circumstances to study with people, one of the first things that they're going to know from me is I don't know everything. And let's look at this together. 
together. Let's reach, let's reach some conclusions, and if we differ on those conclusions, then let's keep studying. I'm, I'm having some exchanges by text with a man in this city right now, and, and, and we're differing on some things, but you know what's happening? We're, we continue to text. We continue to talk, and I like that, and I tell him, let's keep doing this. Let's talk. And he'll send me something to look at, and I'll send him something to look at. Sometimes we'll get together. But, but, but the point of that is, is there's, there's this continued need and interest in, let, let's look at this and let's try to reach some conclusions. So what will happen in time, if, if we're both honest, is that this, this ignorance is going to go out the window. We're not going to be ignorant anymore. We're going to know. And then, and then this, this is something that, that this last thing that I want to call to your attention is something that, that can affect us drastically. And probably, probably, it is the thing that affects this group and any religious group, whether they're God's people, whether they're part of a denomination, no matter, no matter where those people are spiritually, th this is probably the thing, at least in this country, in this part of the world, that affects us more than any. And that is the, the what Blake read for us at the beginning tonight from the second chapter of 1 John, where John says this, do not love the world. Or the things in the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And furthermore, John would say, and the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Now, I'm going to just tell you, and you know this, the world offers a whole lot. When you are, when you are an affluent people, like we are, when you have blessings that most in the world don't, like we do, when we have the ability to do things that most in the world don't. The world, the world can eat you up because what happens in the world, there is lust, there is love, and there is lust. That's really what pride is. Pride is really selfish lust. Now John doesn't use it, and I'm certainly not trying to suggest that what John could have said is that, that there's three lusts. I'm not saying I'm saying three lusts, lust and pride are what he says, and I understand that. I think we all understand that. But, but the point of this is, is that and when he says in verse 17 that the world is passing away, that, that's, that's not, John is not saying it what Paul said, but it's the same idea. The world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. We know that practically, don't we? We see it every day. Everybody, everybody who dies, there are people who die every day, right? There are people we know who die probably on a weekly basis. And every time we go to that funeral, how many of those people are taking stuff with them? And if they are, how many of those people are taking stuff with them that they're going to use? None. Nobody. So, so we, we do understand this, yet it's so hard for us to get away from it. Because we're, we're affected so much by this, what I call this carnal mentality that says, you know, I can afford it, I can do it, I want to do it, and therefore somehow we reason that, that I ought to do it. And, and maybe that's the problem for many of you, and possibly for you, is that I know what I can do, but it's hard for me to distinguish between what I ought to do and what I want to do. And all of these things, and I know we look at this verse and we go, well, you know, this lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He's talking to people that it affects. He's talking about us. He's talking about us. Because everybody's affected by that. Everybody. I'm affected by that. And if I'm not careful, it causes me to care. Verse 17 says, but he who does the will of God abides forever. There's the key. There, there's the caring like I ought to care. So i got to get away from that other stuff. He's not, saying, he's not saying get rid of all that. He's saying just handle that. And if you don't care like you should, and the only person who can handle it is you.
And so the application falls, you see, with each and every one of us. And it may be that, that the people who don't care a bit about caring about spiritual things, I get that. Because they just, they just don't know, or they simply just don't care. But that's not this group. That's not, that's not a group of people that are going to come at 5 o'clock on a Sunday night, most every Sunday night of their life, and listen to things that are spiritual. That's not this group. But this group still needs to hear that because I'm part of this group and I know I need to hear it. So we got to do. And we got to ask ourselves, do we do it? Let me, as I close, I want you to think about this. You're familiar with that too. Did those people care about the Lord? They care about did they care about God's people? Oh, yes, they did. They cared about God's people. I mean, they cared about each other in tremendous kind of ways. It would do us all good on a periodic basis to just go back and read Acts 2 and say, what, how did these people feel about God? And how did these people feel about each other? What did they try to accomplish with each other? And then finally, the question I would ask is, how, how, how did they feel about the word that had changed their lives? They were studying it. How often were they studying it? Every day. And there's a pretty clear indication that they were studying it every day together. Now, I'm not suggesting that we got to start meeting every day. Good man, every day. No, I'm not suggesting that. Well, you can study on your own. But, but when the call of the gospel first went out, there's a pretty clear indication spent a lot of time together. And they did that, I think, because the care factor in their hearts and in their minds was as strong as it could ever be. Probably. I, again, I don't, you say that's speculation. I'm not saying that everybody was like that, but I'm saying that there seemed to be that it was new, they were zealous for it, they wanted it, that's what they did. And that's what we ought to do. If, if, if we don't care, Please understand me. I, I, when I say if we don't, I'm not saying we don't. I'm just saying let's all measure ourselves by what we know we are. I, I can't measure you, nor can you measure me, but we can measure ourselves and determine if, if these things are getting in the way. Am I, am I getting in the way of myself? Are my selfish intentions getting in the way? Or do I just not know what I should be doing? And that may be true. Or, or, or do I just not care? That that's what we're supposed to do. Practically speaking, we all know what we need to care about. I, I may say practically, theoretically, and intellectually, we get the point. The stuff of the world is not going to last. And we want to get that point. We're going to care about it. But it's sure as fun when we have it. And we have it as well as anybody in the whole world. We've got it. We just got to use it. That's what this group is. Are you fully caring about spiritual things? Only you can do that. And you make the change that's needed. Paul says we've got to do that. Thank you for listening. You're wonderful. And it's, a, it's something that I very much appreciate. If you have a spiritual need tonight, maybe you've heard me come across. You know, people who aren't Christians don't have any need. You ever thought about that? Well, that's true. If you're not a child of God, you don't have any hope. You can't have hope in Christ. It doesn't say you can have hope unless you're in Christ. That's what being a Christian is all about, being in Christ, doing what Christ asks us to do. So think about that. Or it may be that you don't have a spiritual need. You, you just, maybe, maybe you just need prayers on a group of people that because... We, we are interested in that. We were interested in everything in Joshua, specifically what happened to them spiritually. That's our greatest concern, always is. That's God's greatest concern, too. So, if you need prayer, if you're just not sure, doesn't even really matter to you. If you're just struggling because you need prayer, let us know. We'll pray for you. We'll help you. Or maybe you have some sin that needs to be confessed before me. 
and you need God to give you God to give you that opportunity. But it might be you need to let us know about it so that we can help you know that you can change your mind about some of those things in your life. That would be the right thing to do to let us know and let us help you. And so we're going to do what we tell you to do. We're going to sing the song, and if you have a need, make it known by coming forward as we stand and as we do sing. Sometimes for those of us who stand up here and meet with people who come forward, uh, one of the hardest things to do is articulate sometimes what a person wants us to articulate. Uh, but I asked Devin a couple of times, and I think I can do that fairly adequately, at least to the point where you can understand it, and you'll know what to pray for. Devin's words to me were, sometimes it's hard for me to realize that God is there and that he is trying to help and that he's there for our family and he's there for me and he's there to help. I get that. Don't you? I get that. Sometimes it is hard. And I think that Devin wants what he knows he ought to have and he can't have and what he's asking is that we pray, that we, in our prayer,